Right, well, let's make a start because there's plenty to get through this morning. Um, really nice to have everybody here. Um, thank you for spending an hour of your time with us this morning. Um, we always record these calls so you can watch them again. And there's, there's uh, the clever tool of Zoom allows you to have captions as well, if, uh, if that is of assistance to you. So that's where we're at. Um, uh, we're going to talk a lot about Workington, but I think there's a life beyond Workington that is relevant to this call as well. Uh, because we're going to hear from a brilliant about a brilliant new art trail that's been pulled together involving a lot of artists that Anne Waggett Knott has pulled together and some of those artists are on this call as well so we're going to delve into that and see what beautiful things are being done in Workington but also there's a wonderful light show taking place at the end of the month um, which Ronan and Hannah are involved in as well so again if you live in Workington or anywhere near Workington you've got a lot of stuff coming your way in the next few weeks and it's going to be brilliant and we're going to hear from Hannah and Ronan about uh, a bit about themselves and about what they have designed for the good people of Workington as well but also we're going to hear from Roger the lovely Roger Lytollis who some of you will know through reading his columns in Cumbria Life magazine or uh, as a feature writer on the Cumberland News for many years as well uh, Roger's written a couple of books that I know of anyway he may have written more for I know um, a more recent book about statues I think across the nation but his first book was had the magnificent title of Panic as Man Burns Crumpets, The Vanishing World of the Local Journalist. And I don't know if anyone's read it. I've read it in hardback and it was absolutely brilliant. Um, I could relate to a bit of it as well from a past life. Um, and that's just out in paperback. So we're going to hear from Roger shortly, too. So that is the plan for this morning. And then I'll probably blather on about the big meet at the end as well, which is next week on the 21st of November at the University of Cumbria in Carlisle, for which I think about 56 people are now signed up for. So that's looking really healthy as well. Um, Kate, do you want to just want, once more just remind why those questions are in chat and then we'll get going? So I've put some questions in chat and I will repeat them because you don't see them if you haven't joined uh, when I wrote them. We're in the middle of a really important funding bid, um, which is really crucial actually to CACN's continued uh, operation to help make it a powerful application, I'd really like some direct feedback from you, the people who are part of CACN. So the questions are, what does CACN mean to you? And, or what difference would it make to you if there was no CACN? So please put your thoughts in chat direct to me so that it doesn't uh, distract speakers this morning. Or please, um, send them to my email address, which I have put in chat, but we'll do again. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you very much indeed. Well, let's kick off then with the lovely Roger Lightollis. Hello, Roger, how are you this morning? Hi, Tom, I'm good, thank you. Very, very nice to have you with us. Um, Roger and I have spoken a little bit over the past few weeks. And I'm going to look at two things. So first of all, this beautiful book that's now out in paperback, which everybody clearly should buy in all good bookshops across Cumbria and beyond. And also the piece that, that really caught my imagination was a piece that you wrote for the bookseller a few months ago about if you are a writer, how on earth do you cope with public speaking? Like right now, if actually uh, the reason you are a writer is that you might be a little bit introverted and shy and kind of the writer's world is not a public world often. So I thought that was a really interesting thing to explore as well. Um, but first of all, Roger, just tell us a bit about yourself. You, you, you from Carlisle, written all your life, journalist? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm from, uh, from Carlisle, yeah. Um... I worked as a, as a feature writer at the Cumberland News and the News and Star from 1995 until about five years ago. Um, and I was made redundant as most, well, many, if not most local journalists have been in the in the last few years, which is partly what the what the book is about. Um, so, yeah, it's a very varied job covering all of sort of North and West Cumbria in, in various ways. Um, I've been freelancing for the last five years both writing features and, and columns and, and books um, and apart from I had a spell at the Edinburgh Evening News which I write about in, in the book as well but most of my career has been, has been spent in Cumbria. Okay and just first of all the title of the book Panic as Man Burns Crumpets where's that from? It's a great title. It is I can't take credit for it myself sadly it was um, we just, I was just looking for some kind of you know, weird, wonderful local newspaper headlines. Um, so I came up with about 20 of them. I approached the publisher and we had a, had a chat and 
narrowed it down and that was the one that uh, that came out as the most most weird and memorable I think of, of them all it's a great title just just if you can just pull your camera down slightly Roger so we can see your chin as well as your that's perfect that's better that's lovely thank you um on the role at the, as a features editor I mean what was the you know what that was that must have was that a piece every week you had to write and you know were there all celebrities but also minor celebrities and people doing extraordinary things anything stick in your mind um it was it was a huge huge mixture of things it was interviewing you know so-called ordinary people and celebrities um exploring issues if there was a local issue you know you'd kind of try and find a local angle on it if there was you know the difficulty of um first time buyers boarding housing you would kind of speak to people locally about about that you know any any national issue you can think of just find people living in cumbria who that issue affected if celebrities were coming to to the county um i would often interview them beforehand i seem to specialize in 1980s pop stars you know whenever someone was coming to the sun center in carlisle i would often just have a it was usually a phone interview talk to them for 15 20 minutes about their career and I mean, there are some really big, big stars. I interviewed the likes of Rod Stewart, for example, um, actors like John Hurt. Um, it was kind of strange to go from interviewing, you know, really world famous people like that to going out on the street and doing a box pop, where you're basically told to go away by by people. You know, when you're interviewing celebrities, you can think that you're kind of part of that world and someone important and high flying yourself, and then you go out and ask people. You know, do you prefer EastEnders or Coronation Street? And they tell you to, to go away, and it kind of brings you back down to earth quite quickly. So, so which aspect of all of that did you enjoy the most? Um, was it the celebs, or was it the um, people about EastEnders and Coronation Street, or the you know the cat stuck up the tree? I think um, I enjoyed profiling people. You kind of meet someone who has, who has an interesting story, and you have to kind of capture their their whole life in maybe 1500 words which isn't easy because you know you can write a book about probably most people so to condense someone's life into such a short space is is challenging but but rewarding when you when you get it right and, and going out to do um color pieces where you would i mean i remember going to the um the annual convention of the romantic novelists from um association that was held at newton rig at penrith one year so i kind of Managed to sidle into there and spend a few hours in this hidden world, going to lectures about the best way to write, you know, Mills and Boone type type books, and then interviewing the people who wrote those books and their aspirations and things. It was or going. Um, I spent a night, a night going to a fight with Britain's oldest professional boxer. Um, I went to a fight at Coventry with him on Saturday night and sort of seeing getting insight into that world. So, yeah, kind of pulling the curtain back and. Yeah, it's seeing you know behind the scenes of worlds we don't normally see. That was that was always fascinating, and hopefully, you know, the challenge. It was fascinating for me, but the challenge is to make that fascinating for the people who were who were reading it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's you know I've read the book. It was it's a great book, and it's a very funny book as well. I think you've got a very acute observer of the funny side of life, um, uh, and sort of the and you know. But just one thing that you know, we will talk a bit about you know you and how you approach. Um, Something like this, because actually you talked about how, you know, when, when you're in the newsroom, because you're kind of quite a shy person, perhaps quite an introverted person, just doing phone calls in newsrooms, public phone calls, you know, nipping down the corridor rather than everybody hearing what you're talking about. Um, you know, it's 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 almost a, a contrast between your writing for the public, very, very publicly, but actually you're quite a personal person, aren't you, if I can put it like that? Yeah, I, I just find writing a lot easier than speaking. You know, writing feels like my natural medium. Um, I mean, I can just tap away with my fingers all day and it just all flows out very naturally. But speaking just feels a lot more, just, just a lot harder for whatever reason. Um, yeah, so it, as you say, even making a phone call in the newsroom could be hard. I mean, I would try and time it sometimes. You know, you think of the newsroom as being a really kind of loud, boisterous place. And sometimes it was. And I would try and time interviews when there was lots of noise around me. I'd pick up the phone and do an interview then. But sometimes... An interview would be scheduled for a particular time. I knew someone would be ringing me at say two o'clock, and you know, often right then the sort of newsroom would fall silent just as my phone was about to ring, and I would think, oh no, and I would just the dread of knowing that people around me could hear what I was saying, you know, which 
probably isn't the kind of image people might associate with a with a journalist. I know there's the image of us being kind of bolshy and putting our foot in the door, and you know a lot of journalists are like that. They have to be like that for particularly uh, news reporters. But you know, I I just hated having to having to be kind of the centre of attention for anything other than my writing. But when you're a journalist, you know sometimes you have to be. Um, and that, of course, applies to promoting your work as well. Um, you know, it's so strange to me, the contrast between the writing itself. I just sit quietly in a room by myself and it's great. But then with book writing, you suddenly have to to promote the book, to promote the thing that you spent months sitting quietly doing. You have to go out and be all singing or dancing to, to let people know about it. Which I, is, thought uh, it was a really, hard. I thought it was a really courageous piece that you wrote, actually, for the bookseller. Um, a few months ago and, and you talked about uh, in that piece you talked about you know actually preparing for um, public speaking at events you know I think you talked about going to hypnotherapy sessions and 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 taking that advice on board about how you actually prepare for talking publicly about your work is that is that right? Yeah well I had, I've had two, two books published in the past uh, three years so I've, I had a book launch for, for each of those and my book ends in Carlisle and each time I, I went, I had a hypnotherapy session a few days beforehand. Um, I did another event to an audience of about 100 people in, in Leeds a couple of years ago. Again, I had a hypnotherapy session before that. Um, I, I mean, I think that helped. I mean, I did the events, you know, I, I'm still I'm still here. So, you know, I mean, I, I was, I mean, believe it or not, you know, I'm, I feel I'm a lot more confident than I used to be. I mean, I would never have even thought about doing anything like this a few years ago, but... Um, you know, maybe as you get older, you just kind of learn to care less about what, what people think to some extent. Maybe that's part of it. Or maybe there's, I realise I'm even more frightened of not selling any books than I am of, of public <laughs> speaking. So that drags me out of my shell sometimes. But yeah, I mean, hypnotherapy did, did help me, I think. It wasn't really a case of um, consciously saying, you know, do not be afraid of public speaking. It was more just a, a case of getting me into a, a state of relaxation and trying to relive that when I'm when I was doing the events. So yeah, I'll, I'll recommend that to to people. It certainly helped me. Yeah. How how are you finding this conversation right now? Um, it's okay. I mean, it feels as if I'm just talking to you. So that's uh, yeah, that's not, that's not too bad. It's it's it's. But we've touched on this before. Or certainly, I've thought about it before. About you know the art. I'm looking at all the people on this call now. Many of whom are creative geniuses, um, and quite a few of them are people that you know absolutely i have quite a solitary artistic furrow that they're plowing i'm thinking of, of painters in particular but writers as well um and you kind of just get on with your thing and you and you are creative in your own way and then suddenly you've got to go public with your your piece of art or your piece of creativity so that's one step but then the second step is actually people want you to talk about it like we are now it's quite a, it's quite a you know it's, it's quite a different aspect of one's character or personality isn't it mm. Yeah, I mean, for, for me, it just isn't isn't doesn't really feel as if it's if it's there at all. It just has to. I don't know if I, you know, drag it out somewhere in, in the, the depths of my soul, or if I kind of put on a facade and or you know manage to manufacture it from from somewhere. But as I said, the writing just feels like it's just inherent. It's just it's just in me. It's who I am, and this is something, someone completely different. And I'm not, I'm kind of glad that I can do it. Sometimes it just um, it makes me appreciate the rest of life a lot more when I go back to just. You know, sitting quietly in a in a room by myself. <laughs> and have you, got, very have you got one or two events lined up for the paperback of um, Crumpets, if I may call it that? Uh, well, I mean, with most books, the, the publicity centres around around the hardback. So I did right. quite a few interviews when the hardback came out. So there's there's not a not a huge amount lined up for this. I'm going into some bookshops and signing their copies of the paperback. A um, couple of radio interviews, I think, lined up, but uh, yeah, not not so much as there was for the hardback, which is. You know, bad in some ways and very much a relief in, in other ways. <laughs> and the other book that you wrote about statues, just remind us what that's basically, that was a national look at public statues, is that right? Yeah, I mean, that, that was commissioned on the back of the, uh, the Edward Colston controversy, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter yeah. stuff a few years ago. So um, that, that was a peg for the book and there's a chapter on controversial statues and that side of things, but it's a lot broader than that. It's really look at... Uh, statues around Britain, you know, kind of who is represented, why they're represented, um, who decides who gets represented, how things are changing, you know, a lot more women in statuary now. Um, and looking at the people 
who are represented, you know, who are they, just looking at their stories. Um, I went around the country and went to sort of famous statues like Nelson's Column and Grey Friars Bobby and, you know, talked to people there about their reactions to the, the statues and the people they represented. So there's, you know, there's quite a few angles to it. Yeah. That sounds great. And have you got another book in you? Um, well, I've written a novel, which I'm pitching to agents at the moment, but uh, nothing concrete to report on that yet. So, but we'll we'll see. Is that set in Cumbria? Um, it's set in a fictional northwest town, so it's kind of there's a bit of everywhere thrown into it, really. So, yeah, it's not it's not Cumbria as such, but there's probably elements of places I've been to in Cumbria that might might be in there in a in a hidden sort of way. Yeah, yeah. And your column for the for Cumbria Life that's that's been going for quite a few years, hasn't it? And is that is that easy to find inspiration to write about that every month? Um, yeah, I mean, I've been doing columns for nearly, um, nearly 30 years now for the Cumberland News and News and Star, Carlisle Living, Cumbria Life. I mean, sometimes it's, it's difficult, but, um, you know, when, when, it, when you have to do it, you do it. You know, some, some months it comes easily and you think, right, I know what I'm going to write about next month, you know, two months' time, whatever. Other times the deadline can be looming and I haven't got a clue what I'm going to write about, but I kind of enjoy that in a way because I know that I will think of something and I, I enjoy you know, kind of overcoming that, that doubt and that challenge, which I suppose is a bit like promoting books in its, uh, in its own way. Yeah, there's nothing like a deadline to focus the mind, is there? Yeah, Be it for an exhibition or a book or a column or, um, or sorting out a Friday Zoom call. Um, well, Roger, thank you ever so much for sort of sharing your, your perspective on, on where you're at at the moment. And, uh, you know, I thought, I just, again, I thought it was a really interesting article that you wrote. Um, I love your columns in Cumbria Life. I genuinely love your columns in Cumbria life so long may they continue um Thanks, and uh, it's really nice to to hear your perspective on on your books oh kate did you want to say something yeah i just just picking up on you know what roger's just talked about i notice pete and anna's comments in the chat which is similar to you know what roger's describing this kind of fear of, of talking publicly um, how does one handle networking events? I find them very difficult and tiring. And Anna says I do too. And the reason I flag it up is that we, we were having this very conversation at the CACN meeting earlier this week about I wonder if there's mileage in a in a if not a training session, then a, some sort of session that helps people to make the best of networking opportunities because it is so difficult for many, many people. Um so I think that's something that we might think some more about. That's what I think. Come off me. I've seen a few nods around the room there. Yeah. And obviously Roger would be our star speaker. Something to look forward to for everyone. <laughs> oh well thank you. Thanks. Good 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 yeah. Good thought, Kate. Let's 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 see what people think about that and whether that can go somewhere. But it's it's, it's absolutely part of everyday life. I was at I was at a people and nature network meeting in at Rose Hill. Uh, one or two other people were hit were, hit, were at that meeting as well, um, uh, just this week. And it was a classic. I don't really know many people in this room, so I'm gonna have to speak to people and you know name badges, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we all have to do it from time to time, and uh, it's an interesting task and talent that some people are good at and some people are, are, are less good at and Anne says there there's also managing and supporting organizations to make networking events more structured welcoming and accessible and give us give us another thought on that in what way um I think one of the most intimidating things for people uh, at a networking event is that there sometimes is no structure you're expected to walk into a room and kind of cold call people effectively if you don't know anybody yeah. um and that's Breaking the ice is the most difficult thing. So I think if organisations can offer a way in for folk, whether it's a sort of buddying or um, semi-structured conversations or a, a kind of um, chaperoned or mentored meet and greet of some sort, there are loads and loads of ideas. Um, then that's, a, you know, a way of, of making sure people have at least one or two folk in the room that they can gravitate towards for a conversation that they know is going to be two-way and, and friendly and welcoming. Yeah, yeah, good thought. Thank you, Anne, thank you. Thank you, Roger, lovely to see you. Um, so, look, look forward to reading your stuff in the future and you can breathe a sigh of relief now and right. it's, it's all done. Thank you.
really interesting as well. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this morning. Right. Let's go to Workington now because we're going to spend the rest of the call thinking about the lovely, lovely town of Workington. And first of all, we're going to hear about the lovely art trail that has been pulled together and is about to be launched across that fine town. We've got one or two images to show as well, which Amy will pull up. And Anne Waggett Knott is the brains behind what's going on. So Anne, over to you. Hi, good morning. Thanks very much. I think there are an awful lot of brains behind this uh, this project. Um, and that's one of the reasons that it's been so stimulating and fruitful so far. So um, yeah, just while Amy's getting the slides up, um, there's an awful lot to unpack beyond the title of Workington Art Trail, um, which is why we wanted a good slot to talk to you today. Um, so there's a lot behind that title that has made this, I think, so far really quite, spe quite a special process. Um, so we are launching Workington Art Trail a week today, um, next Friday, and it will be, be open 24 seven throughout the winter until the end of February. So loads of opportunity to see it and really accessible. Um, it's uh, delivered by Cumberland Council um, and funded by Arts Council England and Workington Town Council have supported the micro commissions, which I'll talk about in a little while. Um, so what we've done is we've commissioned three artists, three lead artists to co-create artwork with community groups over uh, a six month period. So they've had quite a lot of time to, to develop it and to build relationships. Um, these artists have also been funded to create their own work um, in reflection to the work with the group. Um, and the works are displayed side by side in the windows of four venues throughout Workington Town Centre. Um, in addition, we've also offered four further micro commissions to the shortlisted artists um, including an emerging artist commission. And finally, within the main commission, we trialed a micro mentoring opportunity as well. So lots of artist opportunity within this project. Um, and just quickly, we had a number of quite broad objectives as well. The first coming from the council was to increase footfall in the town centre um, and to place high quality contemporary art in places that you might not expect to find it. And the footfall's in particularly important in January and February. So go and see it then. Um, we also wanted to give community groups access to art artists. Um, and I wanted that to be access to artists who had a really current contemporary practice beyond solely kind of a public engagement practice as well, um, to give these community groups a chance to really experiment and express themselves creatively in new ways. Um, we wanted to offer slightly experimental commissions, but also high quality commissions for this part of the region too, um, which enable the artists to develop their and div diversify their own practice as well. Um, and as part of this, I wanted to support Cumberland Council to develop an artist led commissioning process. So they have a framework on which to build um, if and when they want to, to progress this or, or develop it further. And if you remember, some of you will have heard me speak about this right at the beginning of the project. Um, this involved going out for brief expressions of interest as an open call and then paying the shortlisted artists to develop their proposals. So the aim of that was to um, reduce the unpaid labour that's often associated with making these applications. Um, so without further ado, next slide, please, Amy. I'd like to unveil this beautiful illustrated map. Um, and this has de been developed by local illustrator Anya Phoenix. So she's done the mapping and the sketching, um, which is absolutely lovely. Um, now the route, if you know Workington, or if you don't, um, we'll start on the right-hand side of the picture, so the east end of the town, um, starts at the HSBC Bank, where we've got some beautiful work by Rosie Galloway Smith, and more close community centre, and that's called All of Us Together. Um, you then wend your way through Washington Square to uh, Muffin Break, a cafe with some of the most enormous cakes I've ever seen, um, right in the middle of the shopping centre, and that's where you'll find My Wild Place by Melissa Davis with Victoria Junior School. Um, you then continue a little bit further through the shopping centre, um, you cross over the road, and you visit Workington Library, which is a super hub for all things literary and creative. And here you will find the wonderful Silent Pathways by Alison Critchlow with Cumbria Deaf Association. And if you fancy a little bit of a longer stroll, you can continue all the way down to Workington Railway Station, where you'll find our Connections Micro Commissions by Kate Lavender, Loki Symes, Nanette Madan and Zoe Forster. So there's lots to visit and you can dip in or out or visit the whole thing in one go, um, depending on how much time you've got. 
Um, the route itself is wheelable as well as walkable. Um, we've got all the crossings on the map. We've got the accessible toilets. We've got seating as well. So there's enough there, hopefully, for people to have a little bit of a rest and be confident that they can navigate the route. Um, the map is available in hard copy format from all four of the venues while stocks last. And it's also available online at workingtonarttrail.com. And online, you can find um, British Sign Language videos, which will have come with a voiceover and with captions. And you'll also find some really nice audio files from the artists um, describing and talking about their own work. Um, so lots of opportunities, hopefully, for the, the information to be accessible where possible. Um, so we've got two of our three lead artists on the call with us. We've got Alison Critchlow and Rosie Galloway-Smith. Melissa sadly can't join us today because she's traveling. Um, and we also have a couple of the um, the micro commission artists with us too. So I'm going to hand over briefly to Alison and Rosie to talk a bit about their work. Could we have the next slide, please, Amy? Hi there. Can you hear me? Mm. Yes. Oh, jolly good. Um, yeah. So thanks very much for. Um, sorting all of this out I think it's super exciting to be part of this project it's been a complete joy to work with Cumbria Deaf Association so what a massive learning curve for me I I don't know before this I didn't know any deaf people and I'd never worked with um, British Sign Language interpreters before so that was a fascinating experience in itself um, what a wonderful bunch of people we've had great fun and we've had very thought-provoking moving conversations actually about what it is to be deaf in Cumbria and I think it's really opened my eyes to the fact that um, hearing people have literally no idea they they just it's that it's not deliberate it's that they just don't consider what deafness might include and how tricky that can be to navigate so our approach with this project was you can see here some paintings of work in progress. So we made our piece in Workington Library, which is where it's going to be displayed. You can see they're quite big, long, tall panels. We've got six panels deliberately a bit. It's a bit mural like, actually. And we've made it deliberately in panels so that there's the possibility when I install it to have some gaps of light in between each panel if we want to. So the approach was very much looking at colour and how colour can be used as a form of expression. So we began by using Joseph Alba's colour experiments, which are quite um, quite a famous way of getting into looking at how colour behaves without getting bogged down in quite dry colour theory. So it's a very practical approach and we started that way. And then we very briefly looked through examples from art history to understand the nuts and bolts of painting. So how you might set up a visual rhythm or a movement, how you lead an eye around a picture, that sort of thing. And we considered the idea that um, more than three quarters of what you see is coming from your brain, not from your eyes. And so in effect, by leading someone's eye around a picture, you're actually starting to lead their mind as well. And so we really thought about this concept of how you might broaden awareness. Um, so anyway, then we got stuck in and we actually started by painting directly on these giant panels um, using shapes, completely abstract shapes. And you'll see that there are kind of long shapes that weave their way through the picture. So everyone started with their set of colours that they'd worked out and decided on. Um, and we discovered there were great conversations. We discovered in the working that um, these shapes were starting to interweave and kind of interconnect. And people started talking about how that really symbolises uh, their own pathway through and into deafness in some cases. Um, and how interwoven and complex that can be. Um, so really, really thoughtful, interesting conversations. So the other thing to bear in mind is you'll see from the colours, we made this in midsummer. So it was actually Midsummer's Day when we first got together. And we quite liked the idea that we were going to inject a little slice of summertime into Workington's winter. So that was part of it. Um, so it's fair to say this is a painting that is full of beans. It's one noisy painting. So we use quite a lot of uh, luminous orange. We use quite a lot of reflective strips as well. A lot of our conversation centred around the idea of invisibility and how sometimes it can be very hard for the deaf community to 
have their voice heard and we talked a lot about that who gets heard and who doesn't um anyway the choice to use reflective strips was in one way to highlight that kind of invisibility that that deaf people can feel it was also purely for the fun of it because we liked the idea that in the darker months when the headlights pass these paintings they're going to kind of glow they've got a bit of glow in the dark paint as well we're not we're not totally sure if that will work but we like the idea that these paintings can kind of have a nightlife and they can do a little a little shuffle on their own in the dark um so the abstract approach was really deliberate um, we realized that by using a completely abstract kind of uh, visual language we were being inclusive really allowing different people to engage with the painting in their own way um, so that that was really at the core of of the whole thing was our discussions around inclusivity and the fact that actually it's important to help people to understand what you're doing so we've written I've written text which is very much aimed at offering a way in for people who don't look at abstract paintings how you might engage with this work so the other aspect of the commission is that I've made a painting that talks to the one we made together so I'm really interested in this anyway this idea of how um, visual language works and how paintings can communicate across time and space they communicate beyond words that's fascinating and in the context of all the conversations we had about visual communication visual language and how sign language works that to me has been a really interesting thing so my painting is equally as bonkers as the one we made together but mine was made in the autumn so the colors and the light are a bit different um and the they're kind of like, you want to think of it like uh, dancers improvising. They're both completely abstract paintings. Um, but what I've done is I've used some of the shapes and the patterns from the first painting that we made together that you can see here um, as a way of kind of activating the painting I've made. So um, it's you, they're both a bit like environments for the viewer to step into, I think. Um, it's very much about allowing yourself to slow down and for your eyes to go on this kind of epic journey through these little spaces. Some of them open up and some of them are kind of closed off and that's deliberate as well. So it's quite fun. It's also quite mind bending. It's a bit like doing brain gym. <laughs> we had great fun, it has to be said. Um, and I must give massive thanks to Cumbria Deaf Association. Who've, oh God, my cat's helping. That's not very helpful. Um, Oh dear, who've um who've been super helpful and so patient in explaining to me how the ins and outs of sign language, in fact, um, because for someone who's not deaf and who doesn't understand the implications of that, I've had a big learning curve. So we've been learning together, and that's been great. And as groups of people go to work with, these are literally the friendliest, most inclusive, fun people knowledgeable, creative, such brilliant discussions. So I urge you to go and have a look at my painting, which isn't shown here. You're going to have to go and get yourself to work to the library to have a look. And while you're there, go inside of the library and on the back of these panels that we've made, I've included some of the colour experiments we did ourselves. So you can have a go with those and try things out for yourself. Um, also, lots of information about Cumbria Deaf Association and what they do and um, lots of information about deaf awareness altogether. So really, these are an invitation to refresh your ways of seeing. So it'd be lovely if you can get along and go and have a look. That's super. Thank you so much, Alison. I can't wait to see all of the work in the flesh installed. I'm going to hand over to Rosie now, please, to talk about your project. Hi, everyone. I'm really blown away at uh, what an in-depth um conversation uh, Alison has given on hers that was brilliant so um, originally my um, my idea for the commission I wanted to talk about clothing and about almost the idea of wearing your heart on your sleeve and at the beginning point I didn't know which group I would probably work with I, I had a couple of suggestions I wanted to work with the elderly and uh, people with dementia and their carers and I also was interested in maybe working with young people, with teenagers to talk about, you know, expressing themselves and who they really are and what they what they keep um, hidden and and what they share with other people. Uh, unfortunately, Age UK West Cumbria um, disappeared in the process of us trying to set this up, which was quite shocking for me because having um, supported both my parents recently 
you know, I did have quite real concerns about what support there will be in West Cumbria for the elderly without this charity. Um, instead, I uh, we managed to get in contact with More Close Community Centre, and I was originally going to work with the Age UK meetup group, um, but it, it became a wider community session on Friday mornings, and actually it was really lovely. So uh, you can see bottom left uh, a photo of just how many people ended up being involved in the end. You know, there, there was quite a few of us. We did talk about initially just working with a group of 12 people, but there was no way I was going to say no to anybody who just wanted to get involved and join in. So I approached the group uh, talking about precious objects. Um, I've had a very, my work is always quite personal and it's um, quite emotion based. And I've had an incredibly difficult year packing up my parents' home and their belongings and, um, uh, and just so much, so much stuff and, and so many memories. And so I asked the group to bring in objects that mattered to them. And so we started off, um, we've got some lovely objects, like a grandfather's ring. We've got um, a scout woggle from one couple. And that's where they met when they were 14, uh, guides and scouts in Workington. And they've been together like 45 years um, my fa one of my favourite ones, which you can't really see it, is um, a two-year-old in the group wanted to do a picture of his dummy. So we took a photograph of his dummy, printed it out, and he did a nice scribble on top of it. And that ended up in the final piece. Um, it, I didn't know the group really to start off with. It did feel quite rushed in some ways, but it was so the the, the sessions were so wonderful in terms of just getting to know people and shared experiences. And we all, we almost got a little bit hysterical at the um, the sewing stage. But the process that we did was, so you can see um, people did the drawings and um, we literally, I had a printer and I was literally taking photographs of what people wanted, taking photographs of photographs on their phones, getting them printed out quickly. And, um, you know, we got um, quite a lot of pets and things like that and and family members. And each one has a story of love and loss. I then took the um, all of these drawings and turned them into a digital repeat pattern that we could, could be used on fabric. Um, so my personal experiences with my, my parents um, in recent years is they both had dementia. My dad died um two years ago yesterday and my mum my mum's still with us but she's got quite severe dementia and it's been quite painful for me um, their loss of memories their loss of um, familiarities things that I shared with them things that I took for granted that we would always know about each other slowly disappearing because they just can't remember and um, you know it's, they do call it the long goodbye for that and so we talked a lot about that in the group, especially the elderly members who um, have experienced that themselves. We talked about with the group leaders who were starting to go through that. So um, together we worked out this idea of uh, the, the installation at the bank. It's going to be for dresses. I work with dresses. Um, I like dresses. They, um, I like garments. They speak to me about human experience and just and just um, shared experience and, and something that we all understand. I like the idea of uh, talking about yourself, uh, sharing part of yourself actually in the clothes that you wear rather than keeping it hidden away. So the four dresses, the patterns slowly disappear. Okay. And um, and it's just that sense of a, of a full life, lots of experiences, lots of memories, and it's slowly fading away. And, and the group have asked me in the installation to have the lights slowly dim um, from when these will be in the top four windows of the bank. So we've got some experimenting to do to make sure they're lit up properly. I'm busy trying to sew wire into the hems to make sure that they they maintain a kind of form to, so that the light can like shine up properly like lanterns. Um, the important part of this commission for me is that um, I was allowed to act independently as an artist in response as well. Um, you know, I really enjoy doing uh, community projects, but sometimes just being given that that space and that support in giving my own personal artist response, it felt really important. So I have done two paintings, which are not shown here, like Alison's. And they will be um, they will be unveiled at the opening on Friday the twenty second, 
and they are based again on objects on community and those two will be in the the lower down windows at the bank for people to see but it's been a really like you know it's been a really joyful um experience like Alison said and um yeah I really love the group and I'm I'm hoping actually that I can continue to do work with them in the future just because it was just so uh the, the you know, there were so much jokes about lining the dresses and and somebody kept saying that they were making their one minute, they were making their night dress, the next minute they were making their wedding dress and just sharing those um, sewing skills as well. And and um, it just being such a, a collaborative project that we made together and all the all the bits and pieces, um, the scraps that we cut away from the dresses have been kept by the community centre and I have no idea what they're going to do with them, but I'm quite excited. <laughs> That's <laughs> fantastic. Rosie, I'm really sorry. Um, we're going to have to wrap That's up fairly awesome. quickly. Thank you so much for such an incredible personal reflection on the time with your group. And I should say that there's all of this additional information from the artists, including some blogs that they're hard at work on, will be shared on the website as well. So I just quickly want to talk to you a little bit about Melissa Davis project as well. Um, now, if I could have the next slide, please, Amy. Thank you. Melissa is a poet, and we hadn't originally anticipated poets applying for a visual arts commission. But um, Melissa's work is about often about display poetry rather than poetry that's just designed to be to be read on a page. So actually, it fitted really, really well with the brief, with the space she has, and also as an interdisciplinary project for Victoria School, uh, Victoria Junior School, with whom she worked. Um, so I'm just going to read out a little bit about Melissa's work. So she says, where do you go to find the wild in your town is the question that inspired this co-created work. The idea was a challenge to the eight participating children. Could they see their semi-urban landscape in a new way? How could we use their poetry to help the rest of the community see wild spaces in an urban environment? So every child has written a verse of poetry and then they've painted with the colour corresponding to whether they imagine themselves as an insect or a bird in working um, and these lines form an impression of the complete poem, which you'll be able to see. Now, Melissa's artistic response um, imagines the idea of wilderness as a character speaking back to the people of Workington, um, traveling from the source to the mouth of the River Derwent. And it uses phrases and images shared by the children who've contributed to the poetry and the painting. Um, so Wilde considers through the children whether it exists in the human world or humans exist in its world. So we'll leave you up to it's up to you to decide what you think um so that's a gorgeous artwork um please make sure you go along and see it next slide please amy thank you so last but not least these four gorgeous commissions by our um our micro commission artists will be on display at Workington train station in that big empty space above the ticket office that has been crying out for some artwork for a really long time um and these are not just small pictures these are over a metre wide, they're huge. They're going to be re reproduced um, on a large scale for you to look at. So huge congratulations to Loki Symes, who got our Emerging Artist Commission, and Kate Lavender and Nanette Madan, um, both of whom are on the call, and also Zoe Forster, who has Ofsted in, in her regular job, so she can't be here today. Commiserations. But they've done an amazing job with a really small budget, a very short time scale, and quite a big challenge. So these are fantastic. Make sure you go and see them as well. Um, next slide, please, Amy. We're nearly done. I just wanted to crunch some numbers. So this project is about depth and engagement and some really qualitative kind of reflections and feedback. But with a reasonably, not a small budget, but a reasonable budget, we've managed to engage nine artists altogether, over 50 participants, three community partners, six venue partners, amongst which there are four venues and four local suppliers. And goodness knows how many hundreds of people who will be looking at the artwork over the next three months. So we're really, really pleased with the, the breadth of engagement as well. Um, next and final slide, please, Amy. Thank you. Um, so maps from all the venues, there'll be labels and QR codes on all the windows so you can get a full explanation of the work. Um, everything's online at workingtonarttrail.com. Um, and I think I've talked about the access earlier. Sorry, final slide. Um, I just wanted, to, oh yeah, we've got a launch next Friday too, 11 till two, drop in and out, email me if you want to come. Next slide, please. This really is the last one. Um, I just wanted to mention that the ring 
symbol in the logo is one of the artworks that Rosie referred to from her project, um, somebody's grandfather's ring, which has a lot of symbolism for the project and the way that it's unfolded. And I just want to say an enormous thank you to all of our artists who I think have been challenged by this, who've really, really committed to the process um, and have turned out some absolutely incredible work. So thanks very much, everybody, and do come and see it. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you, Al. Thank you to others on the call as well. Looking forward to seeing that. Um, and it's there for some time to come. So really, really enjoyable. What variety as well. But there's more stuff going on in Workington too. So let's finally complete the call this morning with uh, a look at the arts show that's going on at Workington Hall Park. Um, for those of you that know Workington, at the end of the month on the 30th of November and the 1st of December. So Amy, if you'd like to pull up Hannah and Ronan's uh, slides, Hannah Fox and Ronan Devlin, who are both artists, creative artists in their own right, doing all sorts of interesting things. And Hannah and Ronan, the floor is yours. Thank you. So Mark, good morning, everybody. So my name's Hannah and Ronan is also on this call. Um, and we're going to talk together very briefly about a project that we are um, heavily involved with and invested in, um, which is coming up very soon in, in Workington. We've been working on it for a few months. It's going to be um, a light festival in Workington Hall Park. Next slide, please. Very briefly. So my work, I'm a visual artist. I'm based in Ulverston. I'm freelance and I tend to... Uh, working communities. So here's a very brief uh, summary of my work. This is a projected piece. Um, it was a. It's. It was involving eighty participants who um, who uh, we we did a digital motion uh, capture on on people's faces to capture their quality of movement, and then we made for um, projected works, which were moons. It's called Our Moon. And um, I made four moon animations, essentially, that moved uh, youth, uh, sorry, childhood, youth, maturity, and wisdom. This is, a, um, you can see these in Blackpool. This is being projected on the Wedding Chapel uh, and Durham Lumiere Festival. And then that um, went to other places. It went to light up Lancaster and, in, and Preston um, also. Next slide, please. This is a cardboard cinema. Uh, so this was a commission that I made in Blackburn um, Cathedral, the crypt of Blackburn Cathedral. It was for a fantastic festival called National Festival of Making that I'm sure you know about. It's um, It was a commission where artists were given the opportunity to work with a local manufacturer. It was an incredible um, program of work. It still goes on every year. There are new commissions. I worked with a cardboard box company and it was an absolute joy they were based in Accrington and together we made a cardboard cinema that was fully functioning and um there were there were cardboard seats cardboard lights uh cardboard costumes and a, and a film an animation I made a film about a girl from Blackburn <clears throat> and it was made with cardboard over to Ronan morning everybody and it, hi um I'm an artist and designer based in the northeast of England. And just to give a bit of context, I've got some connection to Cumbria, having recently designed the logo and website for everyone here who also commissioned Hannah and I to do this upcoming light festival. Um, next slide, please. So as well as being a designer, I make um, large scale light installations. And this is a 30 meter light and water piece that I made on the Slate Mountains of uh, North Wales for the finale of a live theater event called Galwad, which also connected to this project was commissioned by uh, Sam Hunt. Um, and so next slide, please. So this is the, um, Sam invited both Hannah and myself to make I think you would describe it probably, Hannah, as complementary works, but separate yeah. works for the festival. Um, it's on the, the, the 30th and the 1st of December, and it's a free family-friendly event. Um, and Hannah, do you want to talk about themes or will I prattle on a little bit? I'll talk a little bit about some of the background of this and then you can prattle on. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, just to make, uh, just to recognize everybody in this. So it's commission, it's an event that's been organized by everyone here, it, um, which is a West Cumbria community arts program. I'm just getting my notes here. It's one of the 39 creative people and places projects um, supported by Arts Council England, funded by the National Lottery. And they're making fantastic work all up and down the West of Cumbria. Um, 
part of the background of this project, which has been exciting, is that they've um, had a citizen's jury, jury for joy, they call it. Um, and this has been um, integral in helping to shape this event that makes it specific and unique and uh, curated in and around Workington. Yeah, and I'm, I just wanted to explain the unicorn. Um, so we, we, both Hannah and I looked at, we've been looking at Workington's heritage, medieval heritage her, herald, heraldry, can't say the word. And the unicorn, there are two unicorn statues on the, on the side gates of the hall. So we decided to take the unicorn as a motif because as well as being the sort of medieval symbol, strong symbol, it also has sort of contemporary connotations that are joyful and bright and kind of family friendly. So we thought it was kind of a nice way to underpin the thing. Um, and as well as that, we've both been looking at um, railways, industrial heritage, and actually really importantly, we've been looking at um, slang. So if, if I could have the next slide, please. So I'm I'm making a digital piece, which is gonna be projected onto the, um, the whole front of Workington Hall. Um, I'm calling it at the minute, I haven't really fixed the title, but at the minute it's called Workington Cosmos. And so what it is, it's a mini universe of signs and symbols. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, they're inspired by the town's contemporary culture, local slang, stories, and heritage. And these signs and symbols, will they're, they're, they're basically running from a software system. That means that they'll perpetually interplay. And, and what that means is that the, the audience will be able to read it in, in infinite numbers of ways and basically impose and interpret it in the way that they see fit. So without the audience, there's no, you know, it's quite abstract, but the audience kind of bring meaning to it themselves. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so the, the, the piece continually plays and 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 it kind of, it, it's sort of unending. And final slide for me. Yeah, that's it. To, just to give you a flavor, it'll be quite a, a, a wide piece being the full length of the hall and uh, we'll be playing constantly for the, for the evening. And over to Hannah. Thank you. So my work is often um, installation and construction and performers, that kind of thing. Like I like to bring lots of different um, skills together. So I was inspired in terms of this project, Workington, I looked a lot at the railway heritage. Um, absolutely was delighted to discover this phrase that Workington is very proud of, which is that they created the rails that circled the world and the rails that brought the world together. So um, they, they have a, a, an incredible um, industrial history in creating world leader, they're world leaders in rail technology and in terms of the iron and steel making and the rail tracks are all over the world. And poetically, I found this um, kind of um, a good vehicle for for a celebration in the at this event for me. Next slide, please. This is a um, these are photographs um, I took of uh, Workington and the whole West Coast Railway line. Actually, to be honest, I travel quite often up and down that West Coast line, which is absolutely stunning. So um, I was trying to find a way for um, these these themes to. Um, be realized in the park. So I'm making a piece called Iron Horse Junction. It involves um, physical constructions. I'm making some kind of eccentric railway signals that will move. Um, I've got, um, my work is quite figurative. So I've got some little bits of shadow imagery um, and also some performers. I'm working with, um, next slide please, working with six, um, performers and uh, dancers who are working who are who are bringing their um, energy really to kind of be hosts and animators of this event they're going to be like um whimsical uh, railway workers so they're going to have hooters and clangers and they're going to push things and pull things and operate the signals and generally celebrate and include the families in this event who come to the park and uh, make them laugh i hope so this is these are some of my working drawings this is all currently um in happening in various workshops i'm getting help with welding and i'm getting help with some of the wooden constructions but um i'm a maker so i am doing a lot of the work hands on myself next slide please 
So the experience, this is like a working drawing of, of signals going down Ladies Walk, which is the big exit avenue of, of working to a hall, working to a hall park. So the event will be a kind of a one-way trail through the park. People will enter. There's another artist involved in this. A Dan Fox is bringing two um, beautiful installations, which are magical light works that he's produced for other events. And um, everyone here has asked him to bring these two pieces to our event. So we hope it'll be a joyous um, early evening after dark celebration for local people um, in Workington Hall Park for sound. There'll be soundscape, there'll be lights, there'll be projection movement. The little tra train that is always permanently in the park, a little miniature train, will be running and giving people rides. Um, and yeah, there's lots to do, um, but we hope that it'll be a fitting kind of celebration of Workington. Over to you, Ronan. Oh, I think I think that's it. And um, the, the, the other thing is, I think, is it connected in some way to the art trail? Isn't there going to be a switching on of lights in the town and then a sort of a, a, a procession to the free event, free event? Um, and uh, I think that's it. You described yeah. it beautifully. Yeah, you're before. correct. Christmas lights switch on and then people will be guided to the start of the trail. It will involve walking, but there's, it's it's accessible. So at no point will anybody not be able to uh, join the trail. Uh, there's no steps and there's no uh, soft, soft, soft ground involved. Fantastic. Ronan and Hannah, that sounds and looks beautiful. And your backgrounds are really interesting as well. That that cardboard cinema Hannah, that I think you said was it in Blackburn you made that uh, yeah, what an amazing yeah. piece of piece of stuff that must have been as well. I think that's that's and also just mentioning the fact there's a train that's going to be there for this park. You know that's got me obviously model railway this weekend. Yeah, can I say one final thing which I forgot, yeah. which is that we working with the local railway uh, train chaps and also we have re been recording Workington Town Band um, who are going to be. Um, in included in our soundtrack it was as important for us to work with as many local skills as possible and we've managed it in some ways like that Fantastic. and there's a sound artist called Ant Dickinson who's making a, a, a soundtrack for us and that's going to be incorporating the the town bands uh, and there will be food trucks <laughs> got it all so oh yeah the trail I think Anne said there's coffee and cakes in various cafes and stuff there's food trucks in the park uh, it's not going to rain at all for three months in Workington for the art oh. train and also for the weekend of the 30th of November and 1st of December at Workington Hall Park. Sounds great and really, really great evidence of, of everybody here, the project that, that's going on there for, for some time, how that money is it's being used creatively um, in Workington. Thank you so much to, to, to you all for talking to us about that. Um, I just want to mention, so remember Kate's request for answering those questions. She's put something into chat again. And just one final thing from me, 21st of November, so that's Thursday of next week, the big meet, um, looking at how we can all support young people to, to, to grasp, make creative careers in Cumbria. Really important topic we're talking about. Mally Chung is going to be there. Lee Mattinson, writer of Steel, is going to be talking. Sophie, Sophie Stebbin from SOMO is going to be there. Mac Benson from Queer Cumbria, plus about half a dozen other speakers as well. Lots of people talking there and a chance for a big discussion, a free lunch. And then in the afternoon, the university is putting on an industry event as well to try and inspire young people to connect with people that work in the sector. So lots going on. Sign up um, for, to register to make sure you get some lunch um, on the link. Thank you so much to Roger, to Anne, to Al, to Rosie, um, and to Hannah and to Ronan for uh, for this morning. It's been fascinating. There's no Friday call next week because I'll be having a lie down after the big meet on the Thursday. So we'll all gather again uh, the Friday after that, which I think might be the 200th one. Special guests being lined up for that as I speak. Thank you to everybody for this morning for spending an hour with us. Uh, have a good weekend and catch you all very soon, I hope. Thank you.